Hi guys, it's up again. Uh, I'm continuing with my series on Popper mana bases. Last time we saw um, Burn. Um, it was an interesting uh, site, right? Uh, we found out that there the mana bases and the plan of the deck had some issues regarding trying to uh, hit the third land drop, for example, for Molten Rain, and uh, also uh, seem to have a lot of issues with mulligans. After that, I talked a bit with um, some people in the Popper Discord. Um, they were mostly uh, kind of felt the same way, right? That they, they can sometimes be a bit awkward with uh, having to decide whether to keep a one lander or trying to, um, you know. Um, Mulian to a more functional hand. Um, I believe that Burns deck should play at least 19 lands, uh, but uh, and not play three drops in the sideboard. Uh, and if you decide to play three drops in the sideboard, maybe add a land or two. Um, and that's not something that Burn can do. Uh, so I don't think it's worth it to play like Molten Rain. But maybe it is, maybe it's, um, again, if, if you have any um, any ideas regarding that, then please go on and comment on, on my videos or, or just hit me up in Discord. Uh, I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to figure out how to do this uh, series efficiently. And I believe that right now the, the best way to do that is to just uh, hit record and record what I what my thoughts are and not edit anything. I don't believe it's worth it. I don't know how to edit video. So um, these videos may be a bit slow for your taste. So I really recommend you that if you feel that way to, to just change the speed of the video playback to maybe 1.5 or something like that um, to just save up time on this. Uh, English is not my primary language, so sometimes I struggle a bit to like find the right words right to describe what I'm thinking. So it's normal that I kind of talk a bit slower than most people. So um, really, if you uh, are are feeling this way, then just go ahead and put it uh, a bit faster in the video playback. Um, so yeah, well, with that out of the way, uh, this video I'm going to be looking at Stompy, right? Uh, Stompy is a, a really aggressive deck. You see here the uh, the list. Um, this deck is similar to Burn in that it tries to kill you as fast as possible and flooring out is a big issue. At the same time, you don't want to play a lot of taplands uh, <clears throat> that could help prevent this flood because you don't want to be losing tempo in the early turns. Um, so uh, it's important, this is very important because you don't want to also be playing like, I don't know, land war elves because it's a bit uh, slow, right? You need to wait. And for that reason, this deck adds Queen Ranger, which is similar to a land war elf if you don't have your land drop. So this uh, can return an, a tap forest, so you can play the game. Also gives some synergies with other cards by untapping them, but mostly it's just to uh, generate mana. So this deck is a bit uh, more land heavy than burn, right? Because you play 17 lands instead of 16, or uh, well, burn also plays in some cases 17, but in this case they also add three. Um, um <clears throat> three land accelerants kind of in Queer Ranger. Um, so uh, one important thing about Queer Ranger is that it just generates mana when you don't have land drops. So if you are a very high mana, uh, a lot of lands kind of deck, then Queer Ranger may not be for you. Uh, but at the same time, if you are playing like elves, when you have like some cards that tap for multiple mana, then Queen Ranger uh, generates a lot of mana by untapping creatures also. So of course it's completely broken in elves. 
Uh, here is just a way of having a creature that can come down early and uh, make sure you can have two mana on turn two, even if you have one land. So that's very important. So this is going to uh, be a... In this video, we're going to try to understand that uh, and how this deck plays. And the important thing about this deck is that it's tried to hit a lot of two drops. The difference with Burn is that Burn has mostly one drops. This deck has some two drops and some three drops. Um, it doesn't have any more than that. And it doesn't use their mana uh, <clears throat> very well in the late game. Like it doesn't have any uh, mana scenes or anything like that. So, yeah, you want to be hitting two lands on turn two and not flood out. So, <clears throat> it's very important uh, to have the right amount of lands. If you play like 25 lands, then you're going to be flooding a lot and you don't want to do that. Here, uh, each card is very important for your game plan. So, yeah. Um, okay, so let's go through uh, the cards, I believe. Most of the one drops are not important for the mana base except we are ranger and this deck the special this deck in particular plays three i've seen some people play four or two but i think three is more or less the uh normal amount then four burning emissaries that uh, are important in the deck because it's mostly their first game plan sorry so it's like uh, their game plan is to play burning emissary and another two drop under two and uh, be a bit ahead on tempo that way. Then Nest Invader is an important card for our purposes because it's hits uh, it creates a, a spawn token that generates mana. So with this and not other lands uh, you can generate three mana on turn three. Um, so that's very important. So this is mostly uh, a one mana two two but at the same time it has the upside to um, trigger more with for um, Hunger of the Howl Pack and also it generates a token that you can sweep up with Rancor and also uh, generates a token that generates mana for the third turn if you have for example an, a 3 drop in your hand or a 2 drop and another 1 drop so this helps a lot with the mana situation so right now we have these two creatures that are kind of generating mana for our plan then we have the only kind of Mana Sink in River Boa. Uh, this can regenerate for green, so that's a way of generating some kind of value with lands in the late game, but it's not something to write home about. This doesn't generate any way of uh, card advantage, but yeah, with two lands and an other place, then you may use this. Um, yeah. Uh, Will Mongrel is interesting because. It provides a way of discarding extra lands if you don't need them to generate at least some kind of value in getting it plus one plus one. Uh, again, these kind of builds sometimes they differ from one another. Uh, I think most of the decks I've seen doesn't play like Y Mongrel and they play maybe for Savage Swipe. I've seen some builds without Elephant Guide and some builds with it, but yeah. Then here, um, <clears throat> an important thing is that Pines is green green and not uh, only green like it shows here. Mostly you're trying to kick it. Sometimes you just use this as a protection spell, but most of the time you want to also be hitting your opponent for a lot. So uh, this can be a bit awkward at, at times with Burning to Misery, for example, and uh, Nest Invader tokens. So keep that in mind. Uh, this is uh, besides this and Burning Tree are the only double green deck uh, cards in the deck, so that has some good upsides with uh, Nest Invader, um, because Nest Invader generates a colorless mana that you can be using in other Nest Invaders, Rear Boa, etc. Uh, then Rancor and Elephant Guide. Elephant Guide is our only 3 drop and we only play 3. It's a big aura that hits for a lot and provides some value when the creature lives, uh, dies, right? And 70 forests. In the sideboard, we don't have anything weird. Um, maybe the most important is building a lobo that equips for three. This would be also um, a really big cost for us. Again, we are prepared for three drops in theory because we have three drops in the main. 
but it's, it's something that you see that uh, a deck that doesn't prepare for three drops, put three drops in the sideboard, like uh, we saw some 16 land burn decks play uh, Molten Rain in the sideboard, which is something that you need to be looking into to do. You just can't put whatever in your sideboard, in your sideboard and, and try to get away with it. In this case, the Equip 3 is a big cost, but this card is there to um, uh, be a good mana sink in the late game and help kill, for example, Tron or something by equipping several times in a turn when you have uh, when it's late in the in the game. So uh, we are not trying to equip this on turn three consistently, uh, and that's a difference that you need to also be taking into account when building your mana base. Um, then these cards also don't, don't matter for our purposes, they are two drops, so that's fine. And so this deck is very straightforward and it has a lot of creatures, so you mostly want to keep a hand that has one land or two lands and some kind of creatures and protections or uh, a lot of creatures. So a good mix of, of all your known lands and one or two lands. You don't want to be keeping a lot more than that. Uh, because throwing out is a big issue. So we are going to be doing the calculation for this deck. So uh, what hands we can't keep? Well, we can't keep a hand that has one land and doesn't have a one drop, for example. Uh, that's for sure. There are some hands with one land and one, one drop that we are going to keep. But for our purposes, we are going to be uh, having that as our um, um, as our baseline, right? So we have, <clears throat> in, at, at least in this particular build, if you have a different build, then uh, you can change the numbers a bit. Uh, and by one drops, I mean by creatures. So we have like uh, eight, uh, sorry, six and six, we have 12 one drops and 17 forests. So I'm going to do the math here just to be completely sure. We have 29. So uh, what we are trying to say with this is that we want to have both a one drop and a one land. So this is, um, we are uh, composing, right? Some inverse geometric calculations. So first we're going to say, well, I have 60 land and I have 12 one mana creatures. I want to have one, I want to see a own opponent hand and I want to have at least one. So this is going to say, okay, you have this probability, right? Then in the other hand, we have 17 lands and the same thing. We want to want to have one um, one land in our opener. So that's the other. So with these two numbers, what we say is that we have this probability of having one land in our opener and this probability of having a one drop in our opener. So what you do with this probability is to know exactly uh, the probability of having a one land and a one drop is to multiply them. And then what we, you have here is obviously something that's a bit less probable because you're asking more things about your probability, but it's a 75% chance of keeping, of seeing a, an opening hand with um, a one drop and a one land. Uh, this isn't perfect, right? Because one thing we are uh, saying here is that we are not taking into account that from these seven cards in our hand, we are also, um, uh, one of the cards is going to be a one drop, for example, if you are calculating the other lands. So it's not completely perfect, but it's more or less a good estimation. Um, so, yeah, if we change, I, I believe I'm not 100% sure on this. Uh, again, uh, big shout out to uh, Leafy in the Discord that commented on this. Like, the conversation was about a three drop uh, and the basically about modern raining burn. So I, I the calculation I did was I have 17 lands, I see uh, <clears throat> I see nine cards because it's my third turn and I want to see three lands. But what he said was if one of these cards is a modern ray because you want to cast it, then you can't count it in the sample size. So it you it should be an eight, right? So with the same uh, and I believe he's right, right? and that would help know the probabilities of hitting 
your third land when given that you have a mountain range in your hand. So um, in this case, if we are uh, having 17 lands and we want to know what are the probabilities of hitting one land in our opener, given that we have a one drop, it should be at six. And that should give the number a bit lower, make the, the number a bit lower, and again, make the multiplication a bit lower. Um, so yeah, it's between 71% and 75%. I believe that's more or less correct, and that helps a lot with this deck. This looks like fairly consistent, given that we are just asking for uh, a land and a one drop. So another thing we can <coughs> we can check out is what are the probabilities of hitting at least two lands on our opener, and this is the probability. So what you can do here is like, um, let's see, can I create here a, um, a notepad? Yeah. So what you can do here, right, is to create a list of rules that you want to have for your deck. So let's say that you are going to mulligan each hand that doesn't have a land drop, for example. If it doesn't have one land, you are going to mulligan. So uh, you can say, for example, mulligans here, things that you are going to mulligan uh, no matter the rest of the hand, and you can say no land in open. So here you can do that math by saying, well, I want to see zero, what is the probability of having a, an opener with zero lands? Um, okay, yeah, I... I, I I, it took a bit for me to understand this, but the hypergeometric probability of having exactly zero is this. This is the probability of having at least zero, and at least zero means anything, so that's why it returned one. So this is the probability of hitting uh, zero lands in your opener, so you have this probability. Uh, 0.08, I believe that's more or less correct, sounds correct, so I'm, not, I'm going to mulligan this. I am also going to mulligan one land and no one drop. So uh, here we took the probability of having one land and one, dro one drop. So um, I believe this is somewhat similar. We, we want to see seven cards and one land here. We are going to have this probability. So we are going to again add it here just to uh, keep it safe, and then we have 12 one drops, and we want to see zero. And we know that we have one landing one our opener because this is uh, we are assuming that we have one landing our opener, so we remove one in a simple size. So we have this number here, so we multiply them, and we have this number. This is the probability of having one land but no one drop, and then. What you can do is continue doing this and then multiply all these probabilities and you are going to have more or less a good estimation about lands that you are going to mulligan. And then you can decide if that's correct for you or not. Um, this is a place where I'm not 100% sure about to, how, to, how to proceed here because if you do all these calculations and, and say you, you look at the number like, I don't know, 0.3 and you say okay is 0.3 correct is too much to mulligan almost a third of all your openers and that's something that you want to kind of uh, look into and decide yourself uh, it's not something that I'm here to tell you honestly I am not so sure uh, about what's the correct number um, but yeah I, I feel that if you Create if you can tweak some numbers in your deck to decrease the number of mulligans, then you are going to something right, correct, with your mana base at least. So another uh, thing that we can say, for example, is I want to mulligan if I have um, five land, right? If I have five or more land, then I'm going to mulligan. I, I'm just creating some uh, um, some examples here. This is something that again. If you are building your deck, you should decide in these things and kind of build your probabilities here. So let's say we have 17 lands 
and our sample size is 7 and we have 5 or more. So the number is again pretty low because it is something fairly rare in an operating in Stompy, but it's something that you want to take into account. Yeah, so if we go back here, we didn't uh, calculate, for example, the probability of using Quirion Ranger. Um, so what's important in Quirion Ranger is that you can drop it in turn two and, and uh, generate mana uh, without problem. So uh, at the difference with Land of Guadalupe is that you can, uh, if you want to know, uh, if you want to know the probability of you hitting your uh, second to your two drop, uh, given that you have an Elano War Elf, then you can you have to calculate the probabilities of hitting the Elano War Elf on turn one. Here we are Ranger, we don't care. We can hit it the same turn we're generating mana. So the difference is that it costs one mana. So if you want to hit a two drop on turn two and you draw your Korean Ranger on turn two, then you can't. So um, yeah, you are going to be, for example, you play a land, you play your little sentinel. Next turn, you play, you draw your Queen Ranger, you tap your forest, you play it, you untap it by returning a plane again, and you have one mana more to cast another one drop, right? But you don't have two mana to cast per intermissary. If instead of being a Queen Ranger, it would be a land wolf, then you are going to be just tapping your mana, playing Land of War Elf, and passing, because you don't, you don't have the mana right away. So that's the big difference between those two cards. So we didn't uh, calculate, for example, the probability of hitting your uh, second, your, your two drops. So we are going to do that right now. And for this reason, I think that uh, adding the forests and the Green Ranger the calculation because if you have an opener that with one forest and one Queer Ranger, you can play Queer Ranger on turn one, and if that it doesn't die, then you generate mana on turn two. And you want to hit two of those. Uh, one important note here is that this means that you could be calculating here about having two Queer Rangers and no lands, so we are going to be taking that into account. In, in the following calculation, but uh, first, this is a calculation of hitting two lands or Queer Rangers on your opener, which is pretty high, honestly. And then you want to be um, uh, one of those have to be a, a, a forest, so it's ninety percent. So again, this is not a perfect calculation. Um, but, uh, well, uh, another way of doing this is like we can subtract in some way the probability of having two Queer Rangers and it's very low. So I believe that just saying this probability is the probability of having um, uh, at least two mana on turn two. This is uh, keeping a hand. This is not the probability of you hitting your second man on turn two because this is the probability of without mulligans doing that. So I believe that 70, 70 and 75% is more or less correct for this calculation. Again, we are not taking into account uh, this. I believe it's pretty low. So uh, yeah, let's take it with a grain of salt. This might be more near 70 that 75 percent but again this is without taking mulligans into account and i believe that's pretty high honestly so um again you can refine this calculation by uh seeing what are the probabilities of you having also a two drop and this is more or less similar to what we did here so you can follow follow through with that i believe that's relatively high so i really like that and then elephant guide um so what's the probability of we hitting a third land drop on turn three for Elephant Guide. The difference here is that we are not thinking about keeping or, or moving any by, based on Elephant Guide because it's something that uh, 
we don't necessarily want to do on uh, on turn three for our gameplay to uh, work, right? You can win without uh, Elephant Guide. And Elephant Guide is a really strong card and you want to play. And if you play it on turn three, then you are prone to win. So it's very important for us to know what are the probabilities, just the probabilities of uh, hitting your third land drop on turn three. So it's 73%, right? So this is another calculation that doesn't have anything to do with mulligan or keeping. This is just the probability of we hitting a third land drop. So this is third land drop without mulligans. So that's again relatively high, taking into account that we are not necessarily want uh, want to do this on turn three. Uh, but yeah, it, this is something important. If you have like um, another uh, very good use of the hypergeometric calculator is to calculate uh, when you have your hand in, in your hand, right? When you have the seven cards in your hand in your hand, you can decide whether or move or keep by doing some calculations. So let's, for example, assume that we have one forest, one elephant guide, and several more cards, right? And let's say that one of those cards is a one drop. It doesn't matter really. So what you have is seven cards and you have only one forest. You want to know if you can uh, cast your elephant guide eventually. Um, for example, let's assume that this is a mulligan and you have to decide what to put uh, in the bottom of your library. So you want to decide it where to keep or mold, uh, to put in the bottom or not the elephant guide. So what you want to know is what's the probability of casting is before the, I don't know, fifth turn. So what you can have is remove the land you have in your hand, remove the seven cards in your library. So this is 57, sorry, 53, because it's 16 minus seven. And then you want to see a couple of cards. We are going to see three draw steps. What are the probabilities of hitting two lands in three draw steps, given the hand that I described that has only one land? So you can do that calculation and it's going to say, okay, it's more or less 30%. So then you can decide where to uh, keep that card or not, given that you have this information. So instead of just doing it blind, you have the uh, calculation that is going to be more or less 30% chances of drawing your uh, your two lands or uh, Queen Rangers in three draw steps. Again, you can tweak these numbers a bit and see more or less the chances. Eventually, you're going to be reaching a number that's pretty high and you decide, uh, given that, like, is waiting for the sixth turn to cast your elephant guy worth it? Maybe not, so you put it in the bottom. Now, if we change those calculations, we only want to, we have two lands and an elephant guide, what are the chances of we drawing it in three draw steps? So the difference here is that we have one less land in our deck and we have to find only one land instead of two. So when we do that calculation, it gives us that it's 72%. So that's relatively high. So maybe you keep your three drop even though you can't really cast it yet, right? because the probabilities are in your favor, uh, the odds are in your favor. So that's relatively important. Um, again, something that I didn't touch here is that sometimes you hit your nesting better on turn two and you cast your elephant guide. Uh, I just realized that. <laughs> so in that situation, you want to cast uh, your nesting better exactly on turn two for you to cast your elephant guide on turn three. So, um, that calculation is going to involve several things. We want to know what are the chances of withdrawing Nest Invader and Elephant Guide and two mana sources and etc. It's a bit complicated. Uh, you can do the calculations. Um, but yeah, I think this video is a really long, long enough. But yeah. Um, so yeah, again, these calculations aren't necessarily 100% correct or or anything, but it's they are useful in the sense that it helps you understand what your game plan is, uh, what are the chances of enacting your game plan. So certain times you see, like for example, uh, hey, I, I built this mono blue aggro deck or something, and it has like 12 land, and you are like, yeah, you are not going to be able to enact your plan because you have very few lands. 
Uh, but at the same time, if you want to be even more helpful and say what are the exact number of lands that you should play in that deck, it's a bit more complicated and it has a lot of nuance and you need to understand exactly what your game plan is. So that's why, uh, again, I'm not a stompy master. I don't know exactly what the mulligans and keeping decisions are, but if you are and you can decide these kind of um, rules, right? You can tweak your numbers for it to be even more uh, consistent. So uh, again, um, this is I, I believe this deck is correctly built. It has Quirion Ranger and Nest Invader to hit your uh, your cards on on correctly. And every time I faced uh, Stompy, I really saw that the deck really performed in that front. Um, so yeah, I, I believe this deck is correctly built in contrast with Burn that I don't believe is correctly built. Uh, the mana base doesn't help with the game plan that he's trying to enact. So again, doing this kind of exercise in your deck will probably help you understand if you want to add another land or something. So yeah, that's all for Stompy right now. Again, if you have any comments uh, about how I do these calculations and how I uh, Anonize mana bases, uh, please do so. Uh, I really appreciate that. And I'm trying to understand here and I'm trying also to uh, make my analysis and my uh, <clears throat> and everything better here. So if you have any comments, it's really helpful. So um, I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, right now we've been seeing monocolor decks, they are easier to analyze and it helps us go through uh, all these different uh, things that we need to calculate bit by bit. So right now we were able to see a bit about how does mana accelerants work when you're trying to calculate your mana base. Um, and probably in the following, uh, the following deck that we are going to see is going to have something very similar to that and we are going to try to understand exactly how that works. Uh, I'm not yet decided on the deck, but uh, it will be probably something with uh, mana accelerants of some sort. Um, so yeah, uh, that's it for now. Uh, thanks and see you next time.